Hi, y'all. In this video, I'm going to talk about the Second Amendment because every time there is a bad thing that happens, that is what is uh, the go-to solution for a certain subset of our society. Oh my god, a murderer has done a murder-type thing. Uh, obviously, the only possible solution is to constrain the liberties of all the people who didn't commit the murder and to blame the people who didn't commit the murder uh, for doing the murder, to blame the people who were nowhere near there and had nothing to do with it for the murder. Um, so, the media plays its role in propounding uh, the lies. Uh, for example, they'll talk about this is a uniquely American problem, and you can point to them stats that uh, actually know our homicide rate is right in the middle of countries around the world. So they'll look at that and say, oh God, well, if we told the truth about this, it wouldn't work in our favor. So what we need to do is look at the data. So we'll look at the data and find a clever way to describe it that will exclude all of the cases that uh, make our propositions false. So uh, we'll say, oh, it's a uniquely American problem in um, industrialized countries. Well, that's not true either. Uh, it is a uniquely American problem uh, for developed countries or you know, different ways of, of saying the same thing, which is just not true. Um, you need go no further than Mexico to see that you can have exceedingly strict gun laws and a very high homicide rate. Uh, they'll talk about how after Australia banned firearms in the, in the uh, middle 90s, they haven't had any mass, uh, mass murders. And you point to all the mass murders they've had since the ban went into effect. And they'll say, well, they haven't had any mass murders by guns. And so you can point to the mass murders that have been perpetrated by firearms since the, uh, the buyback, which wasn't a buyback. Buyback implies that you first owned it and you're now just buying back what it was that you earlier sold. But anyway, uh, and they'll say, oh, God, that doesn't work either. So then they'll, they'll start just adding on qualifier after qualifier after qualifier to exclude incident after incident after incident until, after they've done all the exclusions, they can then say, with all these qualifiers, that in that respect it's a uniquely American problem. So they've gone from the no mass murders have happened to no mass shootings have happened to no mass gun homicides have happened to no public mass gun homicides in schools have happened since the gun ban. Well, I guess that's true. There have not been any... Mass, sh mass gun homicides in public schools in Australia since they did the uh, buyback. You have to add a lot of qualifiers before you get to the claim that uh, the thing just doesn't happen. In other ways, you can just lie, uh, use different uh, criteria to exclude or include um, events as they, ha as they have happened. For example, if you say that on a consistent definition that it, a gun a mass uh, homicide by guns it occurs when four or more people are killed in one incident by a firearm. Uh, then you get one result, and if you say three or more, you get a different result. So what you want to do is to up to play up the number that happened before. Uh, so you use use the lowest number you can get that will jack the number up before the uh, date in question you're interested in, and then after that date, you use a higher uh, number to qualify. So if it's three before, you'll get a higher number of them. And if it's four after, you'll get a lower number of them. And then you can say, well, see, the gun ban worked. No, the gun ban didn't work. You've just decided to change what will qualify before and after. How convenient. And it's, this hap the, the opposite side of that happens in the United States. They'll say that uh, we're having an uptick in these incidents on the new definition where you only need to kill three people to qualify versus the four people you used to have to kill uh, in order for it to qualify. It's just lying. You know, lies, damned lies, and statistics coupled with the media. So I guess that's the fourth uh, degree of lying right there, is, is the combination of the damned lies, the statistics, and uh, the media presence. But naturally, the only possible solution that could ever hope to resolve this issue is to attack the liberties of the American people. For some reason, uh, that will be the panacea. Now, of course, they realize, uh, you know, the leftists, the gun grabbers, realize that their actual end goal isn't palatable at the moment, so they have a position that they'll tolerate for the second, uh, and then as soon as you agree, as soon as you compromise just a little bit on that proposition, they turn around and go, well, all we're asking for now is just one more law. Be reasonable. Come on, can't you just be reasonable? Every single law that we've had passed on 
uh, gun control, every gun control law passed has been sold on that same argument. We just want some reasonable regulations. And so gun rights folks like myself, uh, you know, and the ones who came before us over the last century have said, okay, we can be reasonable. Uh, we have a preferred position, you know, that you just leave it on, you leave the Second Amendment unmolested uh, entirely. But uh, for the sake of everyone getting along and the fact that the inconvenience you're going to impose isn't very large, and that as Justice Breyer will talk about the way our Constitution is devised, it's on compromise, which means that you have some play in the joints on all those principles, we'll accept some limitations. We can, you know, they're not preferable to us, but we can deal with them. And so we say, okay, we'll compromise, we'll be reasonable. Uh, here you can have this law. Uh, we'll compromise, we'll be reasonable, you can have this other law. Well, now we're many hundreds of laws into this process, and the same uh, shuck and jive is being pulled. We just want some common sense laws. We just want a reasonable law. Well, if you're going to say that all we need is a reasonable law, which is what they claim to be advocating for, then what you have to say is that uh, all the laws that we have, which were sold as being reasonable, turned out not to be reasonable, which is precisely the argument my side made when they were proposed. These aren't reasonable, they're not commonsensical, they're not going to do what you claim they're going to do, but we'll go along with it anyway for the sake of getting along. And, uh, you know, here we are with them, and they're still saying, all we want is some reasonable laws. Well, that, that implies the laws that we have aren't reasonable. I completely agree. Now, I have a preferred position, but I also have a position with which I'm comfortable existing. You know, it's, given my druthers, I would get rid of most of the gun control laws that we have, if not all of them. Probably not all of them, but at least most of them. Uh, but I will make do with these, these inroads on Second Amendment liberties of the American people just for the sake of getting along. That's what compromise is all about. But what the left is running up against, and has been running up against for the last couple of years, is they are, they are realizing they're reaching the natural limit of the extent to which we're going to compromise. I mentioned again, we are hundreds of laws into this. Now, some people will bring up that this is a slippery slope. No, it's not a slippery slope. We aren't at the first law with somebody going, oh my god, if you pass this one law, all bets are off, and uh, bam, you know, full confiscation of all guns for everyone is a consequence. We're hundreds of laws into this now for uh, about a century. We can look at the trajectory. We have a lot of data. And you can say, well, if you follow the trend uh, of what they propose, their, their pattern over a century, it has one inevitable conclusion. The total disarmament of virtually, or the near total disarmament of virtually all citizens in the United States. Well, it's interesting. Uh, as a side note, there was a headline the other day that the first transgender person uh, openly has enlisted in the, in the military. So on the one hand, we'll be told that um, the mentally uh, odd should not have ex access to firearms, but a person who has a mental condition that has one of the highest suicide rates of all mental conditions should nevertheless have uh, the access to military weaponry. How this works in the liberal mind, I don't know, but, you know, I don't pretend that they are a fully rational group of people, or even a mostly rational group of people, or even a moderately rational group of people. you, you got to pick a position there. Either it's the case that people who have uh, mental conditions that, give, you know, that make them devalue life in some way should be debarred, or you have to accept that, uh, no, actually that's not a disqualifying condition. If it's disqualifying for a citizen, it should be disqualifying for a citizen who has uh, taken a job where carrying firearms is, um, well, part of the job. Now, they'll point to things like how my policies won't work because, you know, they'll say things, I get painted with Wayne LaPierre's nonsense a lot. Oh, the only uh, thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. Not true. Uh, when, Lane, when Wayne LaPierre says that, he should be uh, called uh, for what he is, a person who is telling a lie. It is not true. A good guy with a gun is a way to stop a bad guy with a gun. It is not the universe of ways to stop a bad guy with a gun. Mass shootings have been stopped by people who tackled the shooter, who grabbed the shooter's arm and wrestled the gun away from them. That the Gabby, Gifford, the Gabby Giffords shooting ended that way. A school shooting stopped uh, when a teacher grabbed the uh, gun arm, the gun hand, of the shooter. So there are other ways to do this. Good guys with guns are one way. They are neither necessary nor sufficient. As the recent shooting in Florida showed, uh, you can have well-trained, allegedly well-trained people with firearms who are perfectly happy to sit by and just let everybody around them be murdered because, hey, I'm safe. So you have, uh, you have to 
uh, take that into account. That it is, it, it is simply not true, and the people who are for the Second Amendment uh, should not tolerate this kind of nonsense being spread by people who are also pro-Second Amendment. It is entirely possible to defend the liberties, to defend the rights of the citizens of the United States without having to go around telling lies. It is quite possible to do that, and indeed, I do that. Uh, the NRA, their relationship with the truth is more tenuous than mine. Anyway, so <clears throat> you'll, uh, you'll see these incidents happen, and uh, you know, shooting will happen in a school, and the one they like to talk about is Columbine. It all started there. You go look at Columbine. What did the police do? They showed up and did nothing. And that has gone, that has been a pattern that has gone through these incidents all the way up to this month. The police are there, they do nothing. Um, so the idea that the police are going to be the protector of the people is not so. And the proof, this isn't a dare, this isn't to denigrate law enforcement generally. It is a bare fact of reality. Every time a crime is perpetrated, has shown, that is, a, is an example of where the police failed to stop a crime, you know, by definition. Uh, most crimes are not solved by the police. Most crimes are solved by information within uh, the, the community. The police, the utility of the police in, in doing the investigations is that the little bit of information comes from here, a little bit of information comes from there, and it's put together. But the actual information doesn't come from the police, it comes from the people. Uh, most of the crimes that are stopped, except for the ones where the police observe it and like pull someone over for speeding or whatever, uh, are stopped by, or not stopped by, the actions or inactions of people who are on the scene when it occurs. So, given that there are people who want to go shoot up schools, you have to ask, why do they want to go shoot up schools? Part of it is because they're murderers and, you know, they're not quite right. I, I presume that every murderer has something odd going on up in his head. Uh, coupled with the fact, in conjunction with the fact that they know, because the schools are very happy to advertise how helpless and vulnerable they are, that they have fish in a barrel that they can go uh, shoot at for very long periods of time. However long they choose to shoot at them is essentially how long these incidents last, because law enforcement takes time to get there. So the, the schools are very proud of the fact, in fact, they post little signs out front that say, uh, if you translate it, Deer would be murderer. Just please know that everyone here is absolutely vulnerable and can offer no resistance at all, or virtually no resistance at all to you. So if you are in the mood to go shoot someplace up, we are a prime target. And indeed, the school districts uh, are going, they, they like to play a game where they want to pit the lives of children against the rights of the American citizens. And they will say, well, if we can't usurp your liberties, we will take absolutely no steps of any kind at all to prevent these mass murders when they happen, if, they're going, if we're going to be targeted. In fact, we are dead set, we are dead set against taking any measures of any kind at all to protect our, our children's lives. And don't give me any talk about, oh, well, we have drills. Hiding under a desk is not a defensive measure. Uh, it might be in Hollywood, but it's not in reality. Oh, we have a school resource officer. You have one officer. Th okay, this is true of the military, where people point out, well, look at this shooting that happened on the base, a place with lots and lots of guns. The lots and lots of guns that do exist on military bases are not in the hands of the people who are being shot at. They are locked behind uh, very hard to get into cages. The military is maniacally obsessed with making sure that it is extremely difficult to get access to any of their weapons. And they make it illegal for soldiers to carry their own personal firearms on bases. So you go to a military installation, you have it, you have it be the case there that everyone, except for the military police and a few other people who might be going to the range or whatever, are unarmed, but even going to the range, uh, it's illegal for you to carry your own ammunition, so you rely on the ammunition provided by the, uh, the military service of which you're a part, which won't be shipped with you. It will be at the range waiting for you. So you bring your weapon with you to the range, then they give you ammunition. So you have helpless people on military installations. The, the, you know, the people who go to war and fight our battles are not trusted by the military to carry firearms without being micromanaged. They do not trust these soldiers, these sailors, these marines to carry firearms with ammunition. When they do carry, um, in the rare instances where they do let you have ammunition and a firearm, 
like for the military police, you can't carry the ammunition chambered in the firearm. That is illegal. Uh, and they give you the suicide holsters. They, they make it difficult for you to get access to your weapon, if you're lucky enough to have a weapon with ammunition, to be able to deploy it in an incident. The idea there is that when the incident starts, what you should do is stop, pull out your gun, load your gun, and then go engage the bad guy. Yeah, okay. Uh, so don't tell me that the military takes this seriously. They don't. They don't trust their soldiers with their firearms. And one of the ways that you know this is they make the soldiers tie the firearm to their body when they carry them because they can't be trusted not to lose it. They're more worried about the, the bad publicity they will get with an accidental discharge or a lost weapon than they are with saving the lives of the troops under their command. You go look back to the bombing of the Marine barracks. They had, uh, I believe it was, they had tape over the magazine. So if you wanted to use your weapon, you had to take the tape off the top of the magazine and put it in the firearm chamber around and then uh, be able to engage with it. These are all me methods uh, that the military imposes on soldiers to make it difficult for them to use their weapons in defense. And as I mentioned, they have lanyards. You have to tie the, the weapon to your body physically because you can't be trusted to walk from here to there without it getting lost. Uh, you go to the, the schools, and they, as I mentioned, they advertise how helpless they are. And then they wonder, why is it that we keep getting selected? You keep getting selected precisely because the people who want to go kill people are looking for targets that are easier than other targets. Uh, that's why when, uh, and you do get this, it happens occasionally, that someone wants to go to a police department and have a gun battle with the police. Um, these incidents do happen, but the death count tends to be approximately the same number as the person, as the, the number of people who go there to shoot it up. That is to say that uh, the person who winds up being dead there isn't the cops, it's the bad guy. And the reason for that is, is not simply that there is a bad, a good guy there with a the gun, is that there are several good guys there with a the gun. On the school campuses, as I was mentioning earlier, they'll have the school resource officer, but you have a very large area for him to cover. The people who go there and shoot this up know that. Uh, they put a lot of time and thought into this. It isn't something you just do on a lark like, oh, well, you know, I went to Chick-fil-A today. I had a Diet Coke. I uh, went strolling on the beach. Uh, I think I'll just swing by, pick up some uh, armaments, go to the school and shoot it up. They plan for this for a long time. They dream about it. They dwell on it. They study it. They think about ways it'll be successful, things that will interfere with it. And then they select their targets uh, accordingly. And they look at their targets and they study their targets. When you have one guy who has uh, a weapon and to get anywhere to, on the campus, if you're on the other side of it, it's going to take several minutes. That's why they give you a long period of time when the bell rings to get from one class to the other. is because of the distance. That applies also to the police. They are not immune to the laws of physics. They know, the shooters know, they have a very good chance of being able to carry out what it is they want to do before they are stopped. Now some go in with a uh, death wish, some do not. But whatever it is, they all know that at most there's one person there who's very unlikely to be right exactly where they're going to start their shooting. So uh, in the police department, uh, you'll have several people there. Uh, so wherever you go in there, there's going to be some officer somewhere nearby with a firearm versus on a school campus. You're going to have one guy there at most who's armed and who, who may in all, in, in, quite, in all likelihood not very likely to be exactly where the shooting is going to start. And that presupposes, of course, that the officers that you have aren't cowards and aren't going to just uh, follow some policy directive that says, oh, you just uh, go outside and wait and wait and wait and wait until you know, the real cops show up with, with you know, SWAT team, the, the police police show up and handle it. You go out there, set up a perimeter, and just let all that killing happen inside. We'll keep it contained. If the, if the killer comes out, by all means, shoot him. But if he stays indoors, you stay safe out front. Well, you know, that's, that's what it's been from Columbine. The experience that we've seen since Columbine right up to the present day, this very month. So that raises the question, why not arm such teachers as are competent with firearms and willing to carry them as is possible? Of course, the left pretends that this will be mandated. Oh, you forcing these cop, forcing them to be armed. It should be, it, they shouldn't have to be armed. Yeah, well, you know, I shouldn't have to live in a society where there exists crime. In other words, I shouldn't have to live in a world that isn't perfect. But I don't live in that world. Uh, you know, unicorns don't fly through the air making rainbows and shitting skittles. Uh, we have to deal with the world as it exists in reality. A part of that is that you have murderers 
who are going to go do these things. And so you have options, one of which is to do what the schools do, hoping that uh, if they let enough kids get killed through their incompetence and their unwillingness to do anything and their indifference to that, that the American people say, this liberty thing ain't really worth it anymore, get rid of it. Uh, that's one, one model. It's not going to work. Or the other is to actually do something. Now, look at Sa Sandy Hook, you know, because people love to stand on the graves of Sandy Hook and say, oh, rah, rah, rah. The Sandy Hook School District, you know, the, the people there in, in charge decided, you know, we should add a little bit of security to our buildings because we're smart. Burglars might break in and steal our desks. So what they did is they, uh, they contract with a security company to make uh, a door that's harder to get into. But in their genius, in their, their brilliant ingenuity, they decided to put a regular window next to that door. How did the shooter get access to the interior of the building? He knocked out the regular ordinary window, reached in, opened the door, walked in, and had uh, a field day. He did everything he set out to do. Because the people who are making the decisions about how to secure the facility have no interest in actually securing the facility. It is just theater. And when they do take measures to, uh, in this way to beef up security, it isn't with the protection of students in mind. It's to protect the things they really care about, which is the things they spent money on. Your students are disposable. Your children are disposable. You can make more kids. But if people come in and steal laptops, that's going to take money out of our budget. And that's what really matters. If you want to know what people look like when they really actually care about security, look at anybody who really is actually concerned about his or her own safety. There are reasons um, the Secret Service behaves the way that it does with respect to any of its protectees. There's a reason that uh, you know you, you go to the United States Capitol and they have thousands of, of, of uh, employees designed just to protect the 535 uh, Congress creatures and the public who may happen in there. There's a reason that when justices of the Supreme Court or judges of the United States travel, there is a protection service that can go with them. It's augmented by the uh, United States Marshals because they're actually interested in security. They realize that there is a threat against these people and uh, they're not going to take it lightly. They're going to take it seriously, whereas the school districts will go around and say, oh, we're under threat, we're under threat, we're under threat, and then we're going to do absolutely nothing. Um, there are things that could be done, and they're not particularly expensive. That will make it more difficult. They're not impossible for these to be uh, taking, to, for these things to be thwarted, one of which is just a smokescreen system. It's used very commonly in other parts of the world. It's uh, hopefully going to catch on here in the United States. They use it in Canada, not for schools or whatever, but for property protection. Uh, what it does is when, the, when an alarm is triggered, is it floods the entire area with a, a cloud of smoke that you can't see through. You can't see, no one can see through it. And uh, so it's not, uh, that is a concealment, not cover. It won't protect you from bullets, but it does make it very much more difficult for a person to shoot you if they want to shoot you because they can't see you. And if you invest in the system properly, you can fill up in the entire space in just a matter of seconds. So all it takes is a person with a button somewhere to hit the panic button, and it's going to flood the entire corridors of the school within a matter of seconds and make it very difficult for a person to get around, give people time to get to some uh, rallying point somewhere in the school that is safe. Another way is arming teachers. A combination of that would be better than just one alone, but it is a way to go. And for the people who say that arming teachers won't work, uh, or can't work, you simply have to look at, look at uh, reality. One of which is that there are zero schools in the United States where the teachers are armed in which there has been a successful mass killing. And there was a, the Pearl, I think it's Pearl, maybe it's Pearlman High School incident, where a shooter came in, and one of the assistant principals pulled out his, went to his gun, um, sorry, went to his car, got his gun, and uh, challenged the guy who surrendered. Now, this very assistant principal is, he's you know pro-gun confiscation. He doesn't think that teachers should be armed because reasons. Uh, he's a liar, uh, or he is delusional. He thinks it is a terrific idea, and the way that you know that he is a he thinks it that he thinks it is a terrific idea is precisely for the same reason that you know that the people who uh, actually are concerned about their safety, like the US, the examples I gave a little while ago, it's because you look at what they do, not what they say. The moment that a school shooter arrived on that campus, this not good idea that he's a you know, the bad idea he's opposed to now. He completely abandoned and instantly ran to get a gun. If he thought that it was really a good idea to remain unarmed when a school shooter walks in and starts shooting, he would have had the moral fortitude to say, I will not go get my gun and uh, I will stand here and just, you know, cower in a corner, hide behind a desk, get in a closet, or, you know, play the lottery of hoping I'm not one of the ones who gets shot. He abandoned all of that, ran instantly to where he knew a weapon was, 
grabbed that weapon, and engaged uh, the shooter. That's because he believes it is a great idea with respect to himself. His personal protection, it's a wonderful idea for him to know where a firearm is and to be able to get to it expeditiously to defend himself. It's good for me, but evil for thee. So when he says it's not a good idea, he doesn't believe that, that these guns should be out there for the teachers, he is lying. Uh, and as I mentioned, the way you know that is precisely by looking at what he does when he's put in that situation. He perfectly well knows that it is an outstandingly great idea. In fact, it is the best idea to get a gun when a, when a bad man with a gun comes in and starts shooting at people. So it's just, a, it, it, it's some kind of cognitive dissonance, it's some kind of delusion, or he is just an out and out liar. Whichever of those three it is, the one thing that is absolutely certain is he thinks it's, a, in reality, a great idea. Just as anyone else who's caught in these situations is going to think once it starts happening. There has never been a person who's come out of a shooting incident saying, Thank God I didn't have the means to defend myself. I am so happy that I was disarmed. It is wonderful that I and my friends were uh, fish in a barrel, that we were sitting ducks. I only hope that everyone else uh, could be a sitting duck like we are. They're happy to say that part, but they're not happy to say, and they won't say that they are glad that they were completely incapable of doing anything but hoping and praying and hiding to defend themselves. And this is the difference between rhetoric and reality. The instant that an incident happens, they suddenly can appreciate, for the time being, the wonder of what it would be like to have a firearm, how great it would be to have a firearm to shoot back in just such a situation. There are zero gravestones of people who have been murdered on in any graveyard you'll go to that says, Thank God Uncle Smith didn't have a gun. Similarly, when they talk about these mass killings don't happen with firearms in other countries, though they do happen in other countries with different weapons, there are no graveyards that say, here lies Dad. It wasn't a gun that did to him what was done, thankfully. No, you don't see that anywhere, and that is reality. It's the difference between reality and rhetoric. The left has nothing but rhetoric, and the right has some of it too. I've mentioned Wayne LaPierre. There's some other people who say stupid things. The, the, the uh, really bad rhetoricians should be told to go shut up, so we can get down to having a very serious discussion about ways to deal with the criminal element that do not include usurping the rights and the privileges of American citizens, of free men to decide uh, to keep themselves armed, uh, to defend themselves against bad people, just like all the people in these situations can contemplate when it's happening. But then afterwards, if they have a political disposition, suddenly they forget that and go, oh no, it'd be a great idea if uh, everyone else could experience the the fear and the terror that I felt when I didn't have the means to resist myself, uh, resist my uh, would-be killer. No, no, no. They'll, they'll try to divert to other things. Oh, well, if we just didn't have, have guns. Well, guns aren't going away. Even if, you get, even if you get the policy preferences that you push for that have these gun bans that'll do nothing, as you know, DOJ studies have shown, the last one did absolutely nothing. It didn't reduce the shootings, didn't reduce the number of rounds shot, didn't reduce the lethality of shootings, did absolutely nothing so far as anybody can tell because the guns are still out there. The determinants of this argument that they have can be, and is only one conclusion, the total disarmament or the near disarmament of most or all citizens of the United States. And one of the ways that you know this is by distinguishing their rhetoric that they say on the news about how we just want reasonable ones for the moment, is go look at what they actually argue in court when they're defending the things that they've done. You go look at D.C. against Heller, uh, where the argument was citizens have... Uh, no right, whatever. There, the It is perfectly within the government's power to have a total ban on all firearms in the home. Uh, go to you know, Chicago against McDonald. Uh, the, it's perfectly within the, the power of the city to outlaw all firearms. Their argument is not about these so supposedly reasonable restrictions. It is a total ban, and that is what they defend in court, because that is what uh, gets challenged in court, and what they really, really want. Well, I, I um, as I mentioned earlier, I have a preference and a position I'm willing to accept. Because the other side has a preference, but doesn't have a position, an intermediate position is willing to accept, what they're going to find is that their increase in rhetoric is going to lead to a decrease in my willingness to accept the laws that exist now. And I'm going to start pushing, if they don't stop it, for the repeal of some of the laws that were passed on the proviso that they were reasonable, because the left doesn't think they're reasonable. They think they're convenient for the moment. The only reasonable laws they're actually interested in are ones that end with 
total or nearly total disarmament of all or almost all citizens of the United States. So, uh, because they can't respect, they, they, they don't recognize a truce when they see one, they can't respect a compromise when they've stumbled upon one. Uh, not only am I no longer willing to compromise at all, I'm, if they don't knock it off, I'm going to start pushing uh, the pendulum back the other way and start insisting that we rescind some of the laws that uh, they lied about getting passed that my side has gotten along with. It, it, the reasonableness of my side depends on the reasonableness of their side. They don't want to be reasonable to any degree. They're only willing to be convenient because it looks good uh, for the moment. Well, the natural limit has been reached, and if they want uh, to see that natural limit constrain and go back the other way, then they should keep on doing what it is that they're doing because they're going to be out of power. They're going to find out you're going to need a lot of, a lot of laws on gun control that will be taken away that they won't like. But the follow-on to that is that the other policies they like, gay marriage, abortion rights, blah, 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 because the, the people who are going to come into power who are favorable to my position on gun rights tend to be hostile to those kinds of things. They're going to see a contraction on abortion access. Uh, they're going to see uh, some of these Supreme Court decisions they like that uh, expand the power of government, the derogations, the powers of the states, and the liberties of the citizens. They're going to see those justices go away and be replaced by more conservative justices uh, who will reverse them. And since they can't stop, I'm going to look very much forward to all of that coming about because they cannot and will not recognize a truce when they see it. They cannot and will not recognize a compromise when they see it. They're going to continue to scale up their rhetoric and their extremism, and this is going to be the result of it. And since it's self-inflicted, they're bringing it upon themselves. Well, you're going to get what you want, but it turns out you're not going to want what you get. Have a great day.